move and allow those brain markers to go up. So I'll take that back one more time. What'd you say again now, the meditation? So the meditation lowers certain markers in the bloodstream, things like cortisol, which are the stress markers, and then that allows the, the brain-derived neurotropic factors and those kind of hormones that promote brain growth to increase. So it almost, it, instead of directly raising those, it removes the blocks in order for those to be raised. So it's, a, it's not a direct causal relationship, but there is a significant portion of where that'll help. How are you? How are you good? Good. You good? Well, that's okay. You good? How's your pain levels? Uh, low. I, I, I was telling Bob I, I'm surprised. I feel so good when I'm sitting down or laying down, and I'm surprised when I stand up that I'm still bent over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to change, retrain some structure there for a little bit, but that'll, that'll get to doing. Part of that is, is getting when somebody up. You know, there's a, obviously an unwinding of the soft tissue and you got to get the muscles relaxed and strengthened in certain areas and relaxed in other areas. But the interesting side of it is one of the pieces of this is you have to make sure that the discs in between the joints are incredibly healthy. The shape of the disc determines the shape of the curve of the spine. So think of it like a sponge. A sponge goes dry, you put it in between your hands, it's not real flexible. So whatever position that sponge is in is kind of the way it rigidly becomes. When we can get those nutrients to those discs, get them healed up, get them flexible and moving, and, and really they're 90% water. You get them flexible and moving, it allows us to reshape this, the shape of the spine a lot more easily than if not. The problem is your body has a very specific uh, pecking order of who gets water first. Your brain's obviously a hog and it's priority number one, so your brain gets the most. And then there's an entire list of, you know, if you run out of water, who gets what? the very bottom of that level is the tissue that makes up spinal discs. So they are going to be the first guy who gets cut off from a water source, even though they're 90% water and you need that in order to have them be flexible. When we get dehydrated, they're the first ones that, that get the, the brunt of it. So again, kind of back to our conversation of, you know, with the cramping and things like that, hydration, especially for here, you know, is such a big deal. Dad, have you been focusing on that? Because I know I give you that water bottle. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of water. Okay. Has the cramping has the cramping gotten better? Yeah, it's, it's gone away. Okay, yeah, so it's just a, that's that's great. That's good. It's just a hydration issue. I always like it when it's an easier thing. So. Again, you know, we hear cramping and you start getting things like eat a banana, you're deficient in potassium. And it's not to say that that stuff is wrong, but we overlook the most simple factor of, you know, keep it simple. It, it is like, hydrated. <laughs> The answer to that one usually no. So you can pound all the bananas you want, but if you're not having the water in your system, it's not going to help. Why do you think people look past the simple answers? You know, I don't know. I, I, I think as technology grows that we keep expecting to fall upon something that's like groundbreaking. I think we all get hooked into that, especially us as doctors and researchers and scientists and stuff like that. I think we always expect like deep down inside, we still expect to see it be this one like miracle uh, type of moment where, you know, the answers are like kind of staring at you right in the face. And, and, I, and I've worn this with patients over the years too, is, is be careful of the search. Because sometimes people get so hooked up into searching for problem or searching for a name for the problem or, or searching for these things that the answers will be kind of sitting there staring them in the face but and look at them and, and we, well it can't be that simple I had a, a Parkinson's patient last night and he's all gung-ho and, and, and his wife's like I'm a skeptic because she's like because I don't you know if they cured Parkinson's we know about it he said well you know about it that there was money behind it <laughs> you know if they, if they could make money off of it I mean the medical situation, and this is not villainizing the doctors, but the way that this system is set up right now is for them to not really get you well, it's to, to create patience, you know, forever. I mean, if there's money in it, they fix it. If there's not, then they don't. It's, you know, but even for something like cancer, you know, the, the answers for that stuff has been sitting in our face forever. They have all these stories, but there's no money to be made off of it. They can't patent a lot. I mean, even if you look at the whole thing now about the whole cannabis oil conversation, that if you take marijuana and you make it into an oil, the, the medicinal properties that it has and how it's performed on cancer and things like that, 
is public record and public knowledge that that patent is held by the U.S. government, and they will not release it because they know what it will do. You know, and I hate to say it, more so than even Parkinson's or anything else, cancer in this country is big business, huge business. You know, three hundred thousand dollars per cancer patient at best. And one of my very closest friends that I have living out here, and he and I've been friends since I moved out here twelve years ago. You know. He's kind of played Russian roulette with his health. He's on eight different medications, didn't care about his diet, very overweight, you know, he's diabetic, all those different types of things. And now they just found out that he has stage four bladder cancer. You know, about two months ago, he started having some heart issues. They couldn't figure out why his heart was underperforming. And I kept telling him, you have some sort of infectious issue going on that this can be cancer. And it was, unfortunately. And, um, you know, he goes into the hospital and they did, for the angiogram, I think the cost of the angiogram was $42,000, he said. He was stoked because he paid 600 bucks with his insurance. So he's looking at it like he got a smoking deal. My buddy's a really bright guy. And he's like, yeah, not bad. He's like, I only got to pay 600 bucks. He's like, it was, he's like, he's like this, this week alone in the hospital is going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars. Easily for me. You know? So, I mean, you, you look at that and can't patent plants, <laughs> you can't patent vitamins, there's no money in them. So they just, no way to look at it. It's sad, but it's true. It's interesting, the cannabis fight right now, one of the things we're looking at, you know, in California, obviously they have much more lenient mm -hmm. laws, and, and we have a, a place up there, a big dispensary in Oakland, that um, is interested in talking to us, they do a lot of media stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're looking, uh, his, his neurologist gave him the okay, it's very easy to get a card anyway. Mm -hmm. But there was a Parkinson's documentary called Riding with Larry, mm -hmm. where a guy, and I have to find, I haven't seen it yet, but a friend told me about it, who had, uh, was much farther along than my dad, but he took some kind of, some form of it, and there's a non-psychotropic version, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, because once you, once you do it by the oil, it takes out the, the, with the THC, I believe, is the chemical that gives you the, the hot. Right. So he took this and, and they time lapsed it. So I don't know exactly what what time it was, but over let's just say 20 to 30 minutes, he went from being completely rigid to being fluid, mm -hmm. and and you know that 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 had that dramatic of an effect was was pretty intense. So we wanted to kind of replicate and do something similar. My dad's in a, a different place, but when we talk about you know finding relief instead of taking you know something over the counter or something like that, much prefer if there was an oil or something like that. And if he has the ability to get it, it's natural. It's like hey. That's fantastic. You know, I, I was, again, talking to one of my patients today, and she was telling me that her sister's got, uh, I'm sorry, her cousin's got cancer. And her cancer doctors, you know, she's, what, three, six months to live, and the cancer doctors told her, no, don't come here. You know, don't come for any other kind of treatments. And, and, and you know, so she was asking me about a certain type of technology that is basically, it's a frequency-based technology, but it's completely illegal, where, where you're basically drawing a big old red bullseye on your back if you use it for patients that, you know, Royal Rife back in the day was basically curing cancer with frequency-based medicine. I think I've heard about this. Is it, does it target the specific cells, kind of blast it, them? It kills the microbes inside the cells so that the cells can return to normal function or just program themselves off to die as per normal. Um, and it's completely non-invasive. It's done with a big frequency light sound machine. It's, and again, there was this huge party. As the story goes, the AMA wanted it. He said, no, thank you. They actually, they didn't shut him down. They sent the FCC after him because they said that his frequencies interfered with the bandwidth of the AM radio. So, and they paid off everybody in between. And then, you know, that, that, you know, and then you know, his technology was gone. You know, and, and you know, everyone knows Rife after that because he became like a pretty severe alcoholic, but because his whole life's work. I mean, imagine you pretty much cured every major disease, including cancer, and then they just took it. And you were left with nothing. Like, you should have went down the history of being that guy, and you're not. So he kind of went down a bad spiral, unfortunately. But it wasn't, I think, 1986, a guy wrote a book about him and brought all that to light. But here's the interesting thing about it. She was asking me, you know, can you find these units and things like that. So the interesting thing is the units are around because not only do vets use them for animals, it's actually encouraged to them to use these for animals, for cancer of animals and stuff like that, but it's illegal for us to use this on humans because it does so well. If you look up, I mean, 
If you look up Rife Technology and you read the actual story, and again, I have a, I have a good synopsis of it. It's really interesting. If you want, I'll give it to you. I mean, but you can't help but feel angry on the inside that that kind of goes down that way. And you, know, you think about all the people and stuff like that. And I told you my mom's got leukemia. And my dad's, you know, she's had it for 15 years. It's benign. It doesn't do anything to her. We've got it completely under control. We would have it gone. I just, unfortunately... She has a type of leukemia that's viral in nature. So she has very, very high viral loads in her system. Unfortunately, she's had nine root canals. And all the viruses are living in the root canals where her immune system can't get them. And it's harder for us to get to them uh, because it's kind of like a leaky bucket. So uh, one of my friends, who's one of the foremost experts on biological dentistry for cancer patients in the country, was going to do me a solid, see my mom, and clear all of this stuff out you know, clean all the jaw up, you know, get in there, take everything out. It was going to take multiple trips. He's not in the state, but he was going to do it for us. My mom was good to do it. And, you know, you and I pretty much had the conversation. If I did what he, what I do and he did what he did, we probably would have a done issue here. However, unfortunately, come to go into conversations with him, my mom took Fosamax, a drug for osteoporosis, many years ago for, you know, maybe a year, two years. Bosomax as a side effect causes necrosis and uh, death of the jawbone. So, luckily for me, my friend was good at what he does and put the patient in front of the money and said, you know, I'm not comfortable doing this without getting some blood work to make sure that her bone will heal if we do this. You know, we could just do it, but she could go into healing crisis and it could be a very really bad situation, potentially even lose her. So, uh, we, we did the blood work, and you know he wanted the numbers to be about 400 before she was clear to do it, and her numbers came back like 120, wasn't even close. So again, thank goodness he did that, but because you know otherwise it would have sent her into healing crisis. But it was a situation where we couldn't get it out because of years later, and you know when my mom was having a hard time understanding, and she's going, it doesn't make sense. You know I took this, you know two, you know a decade, two decades ago. How can this still be affecting me? And Fosamax is a half-life of 29 years. So it's in there, it's still in there, caused a side effect and it did the damage. So, you know, at, at this point, like I keep telling her, if it's benign and it's there, but it's not doing any damage, you live a normal, happy, healthy, you've had this for 15 years, you live a normal, happy, healthy life, you work, you play, you do what you want to do. Yeah, maybe she has a little less leeway on diet than versus somebody else who doesn't carry any infectious load, but her life is good. You know, so uh, it's which one of those things, but you know, still the same conversation. You know. You yeah, it seems to get back to the same approach. I mean, whether it's, I mean, kind of you know, globalizing the idea we were talking about this morning. You know, the idea of whether it's you know a war where you're trying to bomb and say, well, we're bombing to do that, but it's like, well, wait a minute, you, you know, what are the what are they what is the term they use in political war? The friendly fire or mm -hmm. the the you know the things they, the unintended consequences or what they call side effects. And, you know, in medicine, it's like. None of the, we had a great teacher, my sister and I did in, in uh, college, when they, um, it was for a class on basically